Hi, and welcome to today's Engaging for Missouri webinar. I'm Alice Roach from the Division of Applied Social Sciences at the University of Missouri, and I'll be your host today. With each of these 30-minute webinars, we intend to share research-based insights that leaders like you can apply in your own work to benefit and strengthen the state's agriculture and food system, hospitality sector, and communities. Today, James Kaufman will present about biogas production prospects for Missouri. Before I invite James to begin, I want to share a few housekeeping items. First, we'll close today's webinar with a question and answer session. Those of you who connected today via your computer can submit your questions in the chat screen. So to open the chat, just click the chat button that you see at the bottom of your Zoom window. If you join today by phone, then you may email me your questions at roacham at missouri.edu. Second, all attendees are muted and may not start their video. Third, if you encounter any technical problems during the webinar today, then please let me know by submitting a comment in the chat screen, or you can send me an email at roacham at missouri.edu. Fourth, we will make a recording of today's webinar available. You can look for an email sometime tomorrow that shares more about where you can access the recording. Additionally, you can find an archive of all of our previous Engaging for Missouri webinars on our Division of Applied Social Sciences YouTube page. So with that, we'll transition to the topic of today's webinar, which is titled Biogas Production Prospects for Missouri. Presenting is James Kaufman, who is a project director of our division's Economics and Management of Agrobiotechnology Center. So thank you, James, for presenting today. If you could please unmute your microphone and start your video, then we can begin today's presentation. Hello, thanks for letting me uh, talk about biogas and its prospects for Missouri. Let's get started. So we're all on the same page talking about, hold on a second, hmm. talking about uh, the production process. We're having a little bit of technical difficulty here. There we go. So the production process starts with a feedstock and that feedstock can be really any organic waste stream. Uh, common ones are manure, food waste, biomass, and that can include grass or even crop residues. Those need to be collected in some portion, in some fashion, and sent to an anaerobic digester, which is a container that, that allows for the exclusion of oxygen. For the agricultural sector, common digesters are complete mix, plug flow, covered lagoon, but there are many other types for different, different types of feedstocks and processes. Out of that anaerobic digester, it becomes biogas and digest it. Biogas can be used in a raw form, in a boiler to produce heat, or in a generator to produce co combined heat and power, electricity and heat. Increasingly common is upgrading that biogas to biomethane, which is a natural gas uh, equivalent. And that can either be uh, put into, injected into a pipeline, into, into the natural gas pipeline, or can be compressed for um, compressed natural gas. In both cases, those are often used for uh, vehicle fuels. So that's the biogas side. On the digested side, digested can be used in its raw form uh, as a land applied fertilizer, much like manure, but it can also be separated into its liquid and solid fractions, the liquid uh, fraction having a large degree of, or large share of nutrients and is used as fertilizer. The digested solids are often used as livestock bedding or compost and can be dried to something that resembles peat moss. So uh, the, the take home from this slide is that the biogas production process can use a lot of different feedstocks, have a lot of different designs, and ultimately have a lot of different products that are, that are of value. So now let's talk about what's going on in the industry. So biogas has really had a renewed interest amongst people, both from an investment standpoint and just from a, uh, a, um, a popular interest in recent years. And this comes at a surprising time because the two main products of biogas production are electricity and natural gas. And as we both know, the markets for electricity and natural gas have really been declining in terms of price in recent years and continue to look like they'll have uh, declined prices into the future. So then why this interest in biogas? Well, uh, as we all know, that is largely associated with environmental in, uh, incentives. 
And most of these environmental incentives have to do with vehicle fuels. And the number one source of uh, vehicle fuel incentives perhaps is the US Renewable Fuel Standard. Uh, the, use, the Renewable Fuel Standard uh, provides incentives for vehicle fuels based on their environmental benefits. And it's interesting to note here that 98% of the most valuable biofuels incentives, cellulosic biofuels, come from biogas. So biogas is a very valuable and incentivized uh, biofuel. States have also been uh, increasing their um, interest in environmental incentives for biofuels. Uh, California is perhaps the first and most well known uh, with its low carbon fuel standard. And again, it's inter interesting to note that biogas has received some of the highest incentives for that program. Other states have followed suit from California. Uh, Oregon is one example, but other states are also considering similar programs. Additionally, corporations are increasing uh, policies to lower their carbon footprints. Um, for example, uh, UPS has committed to using biogas, or uh, upgraded biogas, biomethane, in some of its fleet vehicles. That biogas comes from landfills. So let's look at how that's affected the industry. Uh, this is the number of uh, livestock digesters over time. Uh, you'll see historically, most of those digesters uh, were producing electricity through combined heat and power. However, starting in about 2016 or so, that has really flopped, uh, flip-flopped into producing uh, renewable natural gas. And there's really no reason to think that that trend won't continue into the near foreseeable future. Also of note in this uh, graph is the fact that low value biofuels, such as boiler fuel and flared uh, uh, biogas, are really being, aren't part of the discussion anymore as biogas is increasingly being valued. So that's the national uh, situation. Now let's look at what's going on in the state of Missouri. So the state of, uh, state of Missouri has a number of uh, biogas operations. Uh, 22 are associated with landfills. 11 are associated with wastewater treatment facilities. And there is a food waste uh, uh, biogas system. But of particular interest, I think, is the agricultural manure-based biogas facilities. In 2015, there were three. And starting in 2020, there were 12. This increase, this significant increase in, in biogas uh, operations is exclusively associated with Roseline and Smithfield Foods. Uh, their operations are very large. Uh, associated with swine cave, uh, finishing facilities and are producing or are anticipated to produce renewable natural gas, probably for the uh, vehicle fuel markets and associated incentives. It's also of note here, of interest to note here that Gas International has committed to plans to build uh, similar, roughly similar um, biogas systems, very large systems. So that's where Missouri was. Where can Missouri go from here? Well, according to NREL, Missouri has the potential to produce 200,000 tons of biomethane per year. The American Biogas Council is a little bit more optimistic, suggesting that, they can, that we can produce 628,000 tons. Uh, that, that amount of bio, biomethane it needs to be put into context. So 200,000 tons of biomethane is roughly equivalent to 8% of Missouri's residential consumption of biogas, of, of natural gas rather. Um, in comparison, 628,000 is 25%. So that's a very significant amount. So where is this uh, biogas uh, potential coming from? Well, it could come from food waste or wastewater treatment facilities or municipal solid waste, but really the largest untapped growth potential is animal manure. So let's take a closer look at animal manure. Animal, animal manure is difficult to transport and store. 
as such to supply a, a biogas operation with a sufficient amount of manure. It really needs to be associated with a, the biogas facility needs to be associated with a confined animal feeding operation, a CAFO. Not only that, it probably needs to be a large CAFO or uh, uh, some co-located CAFOs. Fortunately, Missouri has quite a number of CAFOs and uh, quite a number of co-located CAFOs. So there should be ample opportunity for some additional biogas facilities. So we talk about needing a large amount of, uh, of manure. And the reason for that is the importance of scale economies. It really need to have a large scale economy in order to benefit from uh, low, sufficiently low production costs. Uh, uh, a review of a lot of operating facilities and literature suggests that roughly 1,500 dairy cows or 5,000 hogs are, are kind of a minimum to uh, have a competitive uh, production cost. And that's a lot of, that's a really lot of animals. However, let's compare that with the average uh, agricultural digester that's being uh, run in the US today. According to the EPA, the average, average agriculture digester has 2,500 cows or 36,000 swine. I think that last number, the 36,000 swine is, is maybe uh, associated with a lot of recent very large investments. But the point here is that you need a, very, a relatively large operation to be competitive. So now we've talked about some of the, uh, um, the costs in scale economies and production costs. Let's see how those production costs compare to prevailing prices. And all the production costs and prices on this sheet are in dollars per million BTUs. So, uh, so a biogas, biogas production from a manure facility can, um, production costs can be from $6 or $7 to $17, depending on the scale and the efficiency of the operation, as well as other factors. To put that into a little bit of context, landfill gas is between $2 and $10, so considerably less expensive. Biomethane is much more expensive because it requires additional equipment and process. So that can be between $10 and $25. So let's put that into con those production prices into the context of prevailing prices. So let's say we have a biogas production facility that is capable of producing uh, biogas for $750 or biomethane for $14. These are arbitrary numbers, arbitrary realistic numbers. If we wanted to sell biogas on the commodity natural gas market, we'd have to upgrade that biogas incurring that $14 and sell that uh, biomethane uh, for the city gate price in, in, the natural, in the natural gas pipeline of $4.28. Clearly that is not even remotely feasible. However, let's consider a different situation. Let's consider a situation where we run a dairy and that dairy has a large natural gas demand in order to, uh, to fuel a boiler. So here we can now build a biogas facility and, and produce biogas for 750 and use that to offset our retail purchase price of natural gas of between $6.27 and $10, and $10, depending on whether it's industrial or residential prices. So the point here is that it is, of this slide is that it's never feasible to produce biogas to, compare, to compete with commodity uh, energy. However, you get closer to feasibility when you are using uh, biogas to offset you or avoid your retail expen uh, energy expenses. However, you're not quite maybe getting to, excuse me, you're maybe not quite getting to uh, uh, feasibility or profitability. In order to do that, you need to look at some other sources of revenue associated with biogas. In order to do that, um, we ran uh, a simulation model of a 1600 cow operation under various scenarios of um, operation and revenue sources. So running this uh, biogas operation 
to produce exclusively electricity, we find that no matter what the electricity price is, we're never going to be feasible. However, there's uh, other re revenue sources that we can consider. One of those is grants. A lot of uh, facilities uh, get grants between 25 to 50% of their total capital costs. Production tax credits can also be a benefit, uh, as, can, as can selling bedding, uh, livestock bedding, or high value fiber. Those can have a very significant impact on your profit of your profitability. Co-digestion can as well, especially when it's associated with tipping fees. But when we put all these uh, different types of revenue sources together, we find that even at relatively low electricity prices, uh, we can have a significant amount of, uh, we can have feasibility, maybe not wild profit profitability, but we can have a profitable biogas facility. So how do we go about uh, finding these alternative uh, revenue sources? Well, Missouri has quite a few. Well, every state has quite a few uh, industries that use biogas, heat, can use digested, uh, liquid fertilizer, or even carbon dioxide. Let me give you a few examples. The archetypical example is probably dairies. Dairies can, have, uh, can use combined heat and power to warm the digester and provide processed heat and electricity to the dairy. Uh, digested can be used for bedding and liquid fertilizer can be used on the farm. Dairy wastes such as whey or waste milk can increase biogas yields. So there's a lot of opportunities in that system. Maybe even a more extreme example is the greenhouse. Biomass from the greenhouse can be a feedstock for the digester. Uh, the greenhouse can be heated with biogas. It can use electricity for lighting, use digestive for growing media and fertilizer, and use CO2 to enhance greenhouse yields. But these are just two examples, there's, there's, there's many. As we're going about looking at those various um, uh, business potentials, uh, there's a number of things that we need to consider. And here we have a short list of those things that we need to consider and that we need to be able to benefit from. Uh, the first is we need to choose speed stocks that are free and consistently available. We need to consider co-digestion of feed stocks that can increase yields and perhaps more importantly, attract tipping fees. Tipping fees can be a very significant source of revenues for the biodigester. We need to produce biogas to meet, a to meet a facility's own energy demands and avoid retail prices. Or we need to arrange to sell the energy at a rate well above the wholesale price. And that means taking full advantage of the environmental mm, uh, value of the biogas. Uh, we need to be able to take advantage of non-pecuniary benefits. Uh, for example, odor reduction. A lot of uh, investment, a lot of uh, agricultural investments have really have really cited odor reduction as a key component of their investment decision into biogas. We need to find inno innovative ways to increase the utilization and value of co-products. Really search for alternative revenue streams or additional revenue streams. And lastly, we need to seek support. And that can be in informational support, but also financial support in the, in the form of grants and tax credits and incentives. And with that, I'm going to invite everyone to, uh, to visit the report that this presentation is based off of. It's Biogas Digestion Economic an asset assessment for Missouri. This report can be found at the Missouri Extension website. I would also like to thank uh, the Missouri Small Business Development Authority for funding that report. Thank you. I guess we're open for questions. Thank you, James. Um, I'll go ahead and drop the um, link to the report into the chat here so you can access it um, easily. Also, if you do have questions, please go ahead and include them in the chat. Um, James, our first attendee question is asking for you to elaborate on a point that you made earlier. I believe you were talking about um, what biogas opportunities may continue in the future and which may not. Can you add some um, clarity to that point? Um, so I think that as far as in the future, I'm not exactly sure what we're talking about, but I think that there are a number, I don't, 
I think biogas it is going to be feasible in the future. I think increasingly the uh, renewable natural gas it, um, is becoming more popular. I think boiler fuels are becoming less popular because they're a low value use of that fuel. Electri the production of electricity is also feasible. As far as different feedstocks, uh, what, as long as it's a low value feedstock, I think, it, I think it is feasible. Manure for sure. Food waste seems to be a little bit more difficult in some, in some conditions. Uh, but biomass um, it can also be used. So um, I'm not sure what is more, more or less feasible, but I think that uh, renewable natural gas is kind of where the market is going. Great, thank you. Uh, we have another question here um, about the two case studies that you mentioned uh, about where is gas currently committed in Missouri? Um, I'm not gonna be able to remember that off the top of my head, but they have uh, a number, was it six? I think it was five. Um, I did five. look at a report. So Audrain County has had three committed facilities, Sheridan one and Miller one. Um, and so those are areas where GAS has indicated interest and in who knows about growth potential in the future. But they also are investing in a number, a number of other areas, Idaho, uh, I think on the East Coast somewhere as well. So they are making major commitments across the US, uh, Missouri being one of the largest. Yeah, excellent point. Um, given the scale of um, a CAFO that's necessary to make a digester most viable, how far can one transport manure realistically, either by a truck or by pipeline? Boy, uh, that's, a, that's a very difficult question and I don't have a exact answer for that. But uh, I guess it depends partially on what type of manure you're hauling. Uh, poultry manure, for example, I think you can haul that quite a ways because it's dr usually dry, poultry litter rather. Uh, swine, um, uh, liquid swine manure is much more difficult to transport. And I think in some cases, uh, or I think in frequent, I think frequently uh, uh, operations are, that are joining together to supply a biogas digester or a refinery have looked towards uh, piping uh, manure. And in some cases they pipe them, especially liquid, uh, dilute liquid manure. So they'll pipe it and can go quite a bit more distance, uh, a mile or more. And those pipes become even more feasible when that digestive is then returned via that pipe to the farm. So it's a two-way pipe, which increases the feasibility and, and feasible distance of those pipes. Great, thank you for that. Um, how fast is technology adding to profitability? for a biogas operation? And then what is the outlook for future breakthroughs? I think that, um, so I think there is a considerable amount of technology. I think a, a couple months ago or a year ago, I would have said that it was a very mature technology and it is. I think that there has been some maturity in the uh, biogas upgrading, especially. I think they are starting to make smaller and smaller uh, upgrading facilities. So at some point, maybe the scale economies associated with bio, bio gas upgrading may be, it may improve. But I think um, anaerobic digesters as such are a pretty mature technology. Um, this next question is asking about the NPV analysis. So did that analysis include revenues from environmental incentives? Um, also, what are the costs associated with transporting gas for uses off the farm? So um, it, so first of all, this is looking at electricity and there's not a lot of electricity environmental incentives. However, those prices are all associated with uh, relative incentives. So five cents may be a contract price you'd get with a utility to produce somewhat um, valuable renewable energy. Seven cents would be your offset uh, retail price for energy, for electricity. And 11 cents would be a, 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 a very optimistic, fictitious price for electricity. So that's a good, actually a very good question. Those are where your environmental incentives are, come into play in this analysis. Environmental incentives are also very important, especially with renewable fuels, however. 
So the second question had to do with, um, can you remind me, piping? Sure, the cost associated with transporting the gas for uses off the farm. Yeah, so it's difficult to do that. It's, it, it, so the gas is, so raw gas is, is, can be transported in low pressure pipelines at really relatively low costs um, to maybe to a upgrading facility or a, a, a adjoining business that may not, may not be too far away. In order though, to get it into a natural gas pipeline, there are significant costs. Those costs can be very high. And there's a lot of coordination that needs to go on with uh, the utility companies in order to do that. So in order to access their natural gas pipelines, those costs can be uh, very, very high, very high. Great, thank you. Um, another attendee question here is asking, are on-farm digesters typically owned and operated by farmers or engineering companies? So I think traditionally they've been owned by farmers. And I think this is an interesting point. I think maybe looking into the future, we'll see more biodigesters being uh, owned by companies. And I, I think that's an interesting business model where a company comes and says, hey, we'd like to build a digester on or near your farm and use your manure. I think we'll see more of that. So, and the, I believe it's the closing slide. You mentioned that co-digestion is an opportunity. Um, uh -huh. Do certain feedstocks tend to work better than others in combination to boost biogas yields? So, yeah, that's interesting. So I'm, I'm glad you asked that. So um, first of all, there's a number, there's different types of uh, co-digestion. Co-digestion, typically we think of food wastes being sent to a digester. And um, this, is, uh, this is mainly to get to achieve tipping fees. And food wastes work fantastically in the potential to uh, increase yields. They're much more energy dense than manure, for example. So you can really increase yields with uh, food wastes. The problem with food wastes, however, are that they have a, they can, depending on what kind of food waste they are, require a significant amount of cleaning and separation before they go into your digester. And that can be very costly. And if you don't do that, you can have, you can have a contaminated digester. For example, if you find some bleach in your, in your um, uh, co-digest it, or your co-products that can uh, ruin the flora in, of your anaerobic digester and cause a collapse, which is very costly and expensive to uh, remediate. However, there I also want to take this opportunity to talk about um, other types of co-digestion, which may not be for tipping fees, but would involve uh, biomass, for example. So a number of operations have looked to add um, uh, crop residues or grass, grasses to their digester to increase yields. Uh, and this is done for a number of reasons, one of which is to in, improve the, the conditions of bio, of biogas. For example, with swine manure, it tends to be overly rich in nitrogen and um, these cellulosic uh, feedstocks can help increase the carbon uh, content and as well as the dry matter and so they can increase the yield and operation of the biogas uh, um, digester. So there's a lot of different opportunities for co-digestion for, for different rationale. So you mentioned how food waste could have some contamination issues. Um, is that particularly a problem with like the post-consumer food waste? And what about using food waste from a, or waste from a um, food processing facility? Does it have the same challenges that you'd see with post-consumer food waste? So I think that um, food waste from a food manufacturing facility is usually pretty ideal. It comes at you in a very in very regular intervals, probably daily or twice daily. It's very homogenous. So think of a potato chip factory. You're getting all the potato peelings, uh, and you know what you're getting, and you know it's going to be the same all the time. It allows you to operate your uh, digester at a very high level of, of efficiency. And it also comes with some degree of, of tipping fee, uh, likely. And that tipping fee uh, is what, so it also has the potential to benefit the food manufacturer in that they can maybe give you the, sell you the, or 
pay you to take the um, the food waste at a cheaper rate that they would otherwise be able to dispose of it, be it go to a landfill or be them have to uh, treat it themselves. So uh, cons post-consumer food waste is where a lot of that contamination problem really comes into play. And there's also a significant amount of collection issues that really have stymied a lot of post-consumer food waste operations. It's not nearly as easy. Great. Well, thank you for that explanation, James. And um, thank you so much for presenting today, today, too. And thank you to the Missouri Agricultural and Small Business Development Authority for, for providing the funding for this study. So thanks to our audience also for joining today. When you exit Zoom, you'll see a post-webinar survey will load in your browser. Please consider responding as we'll use the results to improve the webinar experience and also brainstorm future webinar topics. Again, you should receive a recording of today's webinar via email sometime tomorrow. And also in that email, there will be a link to the slides used during today's presentation. Our next Engaging for Missouri webinar will take place on Wednesday, November 11th. We'll have a 1 p.m. start time. Associate Professor Dr. Wa Kitchen will share a presentation titled Changing Risk Perception and Behavior in Response to the Coronavirus Disease 2019. Thanks again for joining us and enjoy your Wednesday. Thanks, James. Thank you.